welcome back and the final symposium know your heartbeat we'll be starting the first presentation that's practical approach to acute coronary syndrome again uh, very interesting a very important topic will be conducted by dr sampath vitanwasam the consultant cardiologist of the national hospital of sri lanka over to you dr sampath First and foremost, I would like to uh, thank Sri Lanka Medical Association for giving us this valuable chance to uh, discuss this important practical approaches about acute coronary syndrome with you. My intention today not to highlight all the uh, management aspects of acute coronary syndrome, but just to highlight very important uh, message, give to important message to you. As you are aware, worldwide number one killer, killing disease, is coronary artery disease. No difference in Sri Lanka. According to our data, 40% of deaths are due to coronary artery disease. Acute coronary syndrome, essentially a clinical diagnosis. That is a history made by, a, a, a diagnosis made by his chest discomfort in the form of pain, pressure, tightness, or burn or equivalent symptom, the corner of cornerstone of this syndrome. The referred pain is a common thing when it comes to uh, autonomic nervous system supply, supplies to the heart. Because of the same reason, not only the chest that you feel discomfort, it may be anywhere below the uh, your jawline and above the umbilical level. And the front of the chest and the back of the chest, including both arms. And in addition, the other chest pain equivalent are uh, breathing difficulty and sometimes uh, profuse sweating with nauseated feeling could be the sole system, uh, symptom. Actually, that the typical chest pain that we expected to experience only experiences about 30% of the patients. And if this speech, if this symptoms comes with rest or with minimum exertion or new onset of symptoms of class 3 or 4 severity, worsening of symptoms in terms of severity, frequency or not responding to your usual medication, or post or MI symptoms, probably you are dealing a patient with acute coronary syndrome. But having said that, 50% of acute chest pains present to emergency department are non-cardiac. So you should be very careful about non-cardiac situations also. This is the diagnostic algorithm for chest pain patient. It's straightforward. If a patient comes with the typical chest pain or equivalent symptoms that we have discussed with ST elevations, that patient comes to the category of ST elevation MI. But if the patient comes with the typical symptoms, Without test elevation, then you need to go for troponins to further clarification. If your troponins are positive, then it comes to non-ST elevation in my category. And if your troponins are negative, in the presence of typical symptoms, that is unstable angina. But you should be careful. There are some cardiac situations also that your troponins may be positive with some chest pain, but still non-coronary disease. For example, myocardial myocarditis, tachyarrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias, Takashubo syndrome are some of them. Even aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism can cause in a similar way, but uh, not a coronary disease. So the, all the other things where you get a localized non-cardiac type of chest pain with non-specific ECG changes with uh, troponin negativity, you can categorize to or rule out myocardial infarction or unstable angina. This is universal definition of myocardial infar infarction. The essential thing is the troponin rise. With the troponin rise, if you have one of these things, symptoms of myocardial ischemia or new ischemic ECG changes or development of pathological Q waves in the ECG or imaging evidence or intracoronary thrombus in angiography or autopsy, that uh, confirm myocardial infarction. We'll quickly go through pathophysiology. 
there are a lot of researchers on the pathophysiology. We thought for decades that the only the atherosclerotic plaque and the vulnerable plaque causing uh, acute coronary syndrome. But there are evidence coming on that non-atherosclerotic situations also can cause acute coronary syndrome. The commonest is the uh, inflammatory plaque that rupture with the fissure which causes uh, blood clot in the artery. With the increasing inflammatory markers and the uh, macrophage uh, uh, close to the clot. Uh, that is the commonest pathology. But there are other situations. Actually, the four distinct, pa distinct pathways has been identified. The other pathway mm -hmm. is the fissures plaque, but uh, without inflammation. Third thing is uh, the uh, endothelial erosion without uh, fissuring of the plaque and fourthly the uh, without thrombus that you may get myocardial infarction due to uh, epicardial vessel spasm or even microvasculature uh, spasm. STEMI is straightforward diagnosis. If your history is clear with the ST elevation in my and is ST elevation in my unless proven otherwise. But unfortunately, unfortunate fact that even this with classical history, with classical ECG changes, we tend to miss this and cause infertilities. STEM ECG criteria. You all are aware, but just to highlight two facts. You need to know that whether these ST elevations are in two or more contiguous leads and whether these ST elevations are really significant. To see the significance in V2 to V3 leads in a male less than 40 years, it should be 2.5 more than 2.5 millimeters, and less than 40 years, it's more than 2 millimeters, and in female, more than 1.5 millimeters. All other leads, except for posterior leads, it should be more than 1 millimeters, and in the posterior leads, it should be 0.5 millimeters to be uh, call it as significant. And other uh, confusing fact when the chest pain comes with left bundle branch block. And as you know, when uh, to get a left bundle branch block in an ischemic patient, the territory of, of ischemia should be quite large. And because of that, these patients are naturally more sicker than other usual ST elevation in my patient. So if a patient comes with hemodynamic compromise with left bundle branch block, regardless of whether it's new or old, I'm repeating, regardless of whether it's new or old, you should treat it as acute ST elevation MI. Having said that, if the LBB patient comes with chest pain and very hemodynamically stable, then you can buy some time to go for troponin before treating that type of patient. Sabosa criteria may be helpful to identify. I will quickly go through. As you know, in normal left bundle branch block pattern, the QRS complexes are mostly negative in V1 to V3 and most of the other leads is positive. What Sabos has suggested in con concordant ST segment elevation more than one millimeter in leads with positive QRS complexes or concordant ST depression more than one millimeter in V1 to V3 leads or discordant ST segment elevation more than five millimeter in negative QRS complexes, that is suggestive of uh, acute ischemia. STEMI pathophysiology is quite clear. Uh, total or near total obstruction of the coronary. The treatment straightforward reperfusion or opening the artery. But what you should keep in mind, if you are going to open this artery, we should open before the muscle going to die. That is within very short timely period that we have to have. So that gives uh, the total ischemic time, gives an idea which time for how much time that we have. This slide explains what is total ischemic time. So total ischemic time, the time from the onset of the pain to the time that we are opening the artery, either form of uh, medical or mechanical uh, thrombolysis. 
unfortunately in sri lanka the most important thing that we need to tackle at the moment patient delay and the transport delay because we know most of the patients when they think that they need to come to the hospital it takes quite longer time sometimes 2 3 hours uh without taking any medications and only taking anti gastric treatment and some paracetamol and the transport delay in uh our traffic congestion is quite significant we should have dedicated ambulance service for that and even after patient comes to the hospital that we currently experience significant delay until patient get the proper treatment because our system is not adapted to cater st elevation in my patient to uh, giving this uh, valuable time that is to keep the total ischemic time in the in the proper range so this is the reperfusion strategy selection that if a patient comes to the pci center that patient should be go for a primary pci within next 60 minutes ideally to give the best results but if the patient goes to a non pci center then we have to decide whether we can transfer this patient to a pci center within next 120 minutes if possible that is the best way of treating but if you can't achieve that target best thing is to thrombolyze within 30 minutes and then send the patient for tertiary center for honorary angiogram and pci uh, within next 24 hours which is called pharmaco invasive therapy which is the best mode of treatment in sri lanka at present treatment or otherwise reperfusion delay is one of the best indicator of quality of care in stemi management there are a lot of practical models has been suggested to improve this ischemic uh, total ischemic time one of the system is suggested by sri lankan stemi forum but none of the system has been properly adapted to current system at the moment which we have to improve are we doing good at this moment in sri lanka not definitely not we have quite lot uh, to improve ourselves and from the patient side and from the government side to improve infrastructure to deal with stemi patient in a proper manner so i quickly go through to acute coronary syndromes without persistent st elevations this is quite easy that i have discussed with you previously if troponin if no st elevations in the ecg and troponin positive is non stemi if your troponins are negative in the presence of typical history that is unstable angina but should, you should be keep in mind in unstable angina your troponins are negative your ecg may be uh, normal and if you are not vigilant about history you can miss unstable angina and keep in mind other non cardiac causes also pharmacological treatment for non stemis there are a lot of armory that we have in our shelf to treat uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome anti thrombotic drugs statins beta blockers ac inhibitors arb blockers anti anginal agents and etc but i am going to mainly deal anti thrombotic drugs today the anti thrombotic drug should be individually tailored to get the proper anti thrombotic intensity by way of its proper choice proper combination and the proper dose not only that at which point that we are initiating anti thrombotic medication and anti thrombotic duration this all these all these are important to maximize ischemic protection to reduce further ischemic event and also most importantly to minimize bleeding risk these are the few drugs that we have in our armory anticoagulant drugs and antiplatelet drugs in combination we call those category anti thrombotic medication anticoagulant drugs what we use mainly is uh, unfractionated heparin or 
uh, enoxaparin, fractionated heparin. But you can use bivalridine in the proper setup, dabigratin in the proper setup, and other anticoagulants, vitamin K antagonists, and the novel uh, oral anticoagulant agents, apixaban, edoxaban, and rivaroxaban. On the other side, antiplatelet anti drugs, our main armor is aspirin, thromboxane A2 inhibitor, and the other uh, main drug is P2Y12 inhibitors, that is ADP block receptor blockers, clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrelor, and cangrelo, IV agent, which is not available currently in Sri Lanka. And the glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors, apixaban that we have, we used profusely in our cath labs, and the tyrofiban and epitaphibide. As I told you, while you are treating a patient with ischemia, the other main side effect that experience is bleeding. So you have to counteract bleeding. For that, you have to have good idea about the risk of bleeding before treating a patient with ischemia. There are a lot of tools available and you can easily download it from the internet. You can get the ischemic risk correct by GRACE score, which is most validated at present. And the bleeding risk you can do by Crusade score or ARC HBR risk score uh, stratification. So you can get some idea about your patient's bleeding risk opposed to the ischemic risk, which can use can be useful to uh, 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 adjust the proper antithrombotic agent intensity due and the duration. So a lot of regimes available for us. If a patient's bleeding risk is very low, then it's the easiest way. You have a lot of combination with us. The dual antiplatelet that we are usually practice for one year in the form of aspirin with prasugrel, aspirin with ticagrelo, or aspirin with clopidogrel. If a patient going for a PCI, best combination, if at all, aspirin with prasugrel. If not, the best combination, aspirin with ticagrelo. But if there is non-availability or economic reason, we can use aspirin and clopidogrel, which, which we are practicing in this country at the moment. Uh, uh, in most of the time. After one year, if the patient hasn't experienced bleeding for last one year and the ischemic is, risk is high, better to continue dual antiplatelet further, either whatever the form, aspirin uh, with ticagrel or aspirin with prasugrel or a clopidogrel. Or with the patient with, especially with peripheral vascular disease, aspirin with low-dose rivaroxaban equally better or better. Other form in a low risk patient, aspirin with ticagrel or dual antiplatelet for three months and then thereafter single antiplatelet drug uh, for long time, probably for life. And if a patient uh, having a high bleeding risk for that patient, aspirin and clopidogrel for three months, thereafter aspirin monotherapy. If the patient's bleeding risk very high, that is a patient who has had major bleeding within last month or if a patient waiting for a un, uh, postponable major surgery within next couple of months, those patients can be treated with aspirin and clopidogrel for first month and thereafter clopidogrel monotherapy for long term and timing of invasive coronary artery. If a patient comes to the PCI center, and his uh, ischemic risk is very high. Ischemic very high risk is defined by hemodynamic instability, cardiogenic shock, um, recurrent uh, chest pain despite medical treatment, life-threatening arrhythmias, mechanical complication, acute heart failure, or AVRS elevation. Those patients has to go to the cath lab within two hours. And other high risk bleeding, uh, high risk ischemic patients, as defined by established non STEMI diagnosis, dynamic STT wave changes, resuscitated cardiac arrest with without ST segment elevation, or high risk risk score more than 140. Those patients has to go to the cath lab within next 24 hours. Other patients are low risk patients, and these patients can go for elective procedure or even other uh, modality of investigation like CT coronary angiogram. 
I just want to highlight a couple of things which come up with the recent ESC guidelines. Now, we are usually giving dual antiplatelet uh, loading once a patient comes to comes with uh, acute coronary syndrome, non-STEMI, before going them to cath lab. But recent guideline highlighted not to give uh, P2Y12 inhibitor loading if your patient's coronary anatomy is not aware and if your patient going to the cath lab within next 24 hours. But if your patient is going to the cath lab after 24 hours or delayed PCI, then probably you can initiate dual antiplatelet drugs. The, by initiating dual antiplatelet drugs uh, before knowing coronary an anatomy, the main disadvantage is one thing is if the patient is uh, uh, going for uh, bypass surgery, not suitable for uh, PCI, then the surgeons will have problem. Bleeding risk may be more higher than the ischemic risk. And the other thing is unnecessary bleeding problems. And this is again, this as a practical point, I wanted to highlight regard, with regard to anticoagulant treatment. Now, as a usual practice, when you diagnose non-STEMI, that we give with aspirin, dual antiplatelet, as I told, and with that tenoxaparin. But the recommendation, don't cross over unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin. And if your patient is going for cath lab, don't do unfractionated heparin because in our cath lab, we are using, low, uh, sorry, don't give low molecular heparin because our cath labs using unfractionated heparin during the procedure. So it is easy that if you are loaded with unfractionated heparin and uh, document the dose and the time that we can top up at the cath lab very easily. And this is again another uh, new thing that comes with if your patient in on anticoagulant drug, either form of vitamin K uh, antagonist uh, warfarin or any NOAC treatment. And if these patients are coming, if they are coming with non-STEMI and going to the cath lab, this message is important. If your patient is on warfarin or NOAC, do not discontinue those drugs. If the patient is on warfarin and if, your IN, if the patient's INR is more than 2.5, you can go for the procedure without administrating additional heparin for that patient. It is safe. And if your patient is on NOAC and don't discontinue it, send them with the same regular dosing and the cath lab staff can add on uh, enoxaparin or anticoagulation irrespective of timing of the last dose. So that can be done safely. That is the safest uh, uh, practice at present. So with that remarks, I will conclude uh, giving the opportunity for my colleagues to discuss and coming, with, coming up with more interesting aspects of acute coronary syndrome. Over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sampath with an awesome. And uh, next we'll be moving to an interactive session uh, again till we make some technological arrangement. There are some questions that are coming from the chat uh, and I will be passing on these questions to Dr. Stanley Amarasekar. Mm, yeah. One question is, what should be the BP cutoff for thrombolysis? Dr. Amarasekar? Yeah. Uh, when you have a uh, era of uh, streptokinase, we know that the blood pressure, we have uh, about 180 of uh, systole and a diastole of 110, 100. Uh, they, but they are all relative because we can bring it down with uh, GTN infusion and then uh, you can go with uh, uh, whatever the, uh, the fibrinolytics. But on the question comes, when the patient is in shock, but the, when the patient is in shock, when the blood pressure is below 90, then the, the fibrinolytics doesn't work. Therefore, these patients should go for uh, interventional procedures. And they can be, until interventional procedures are done, they can be managed with uh, low molecular heparin or heparin. And then uh, arrangement should be made to get this patient into the cath lab. 
Uh, next question is also related to the same. What's the advantage of heparin or inoxifarin? Yeah, now, uh, in, when it comes to ST elevation MI, we have just mentioned in our previous lecture uh, that the, the, if the patient goes to the cath lab, it's very easy to calculate the dosage of heparin for topping up uh, in the process of uh, angiography and interventions. Therefore, the patient should be loaded first if possible with uh, low molecular heparin. The bolus dose is, so you can start with the 300, uh, 3000 units and then you can make it 1000 units per hour or else you can uh, transfer the patient with 3000 units of bolus to uh, a cath lab facility and then uh, after loading with the antiplatelets. But of course, the present criteria is to not to give the P2Y12 receptors until you know the coronary anatomy. And uh, topping up of uh, heparin can be done in the cath lab. Uh, but if there is no cath lab facility in uh, in a non-cath lab facility, of course, uh, fibrinolytic ha has to be accompanied with uh, unfractionated heparin. Yeah. And uh, one final question before we move on. What are the safer drugs to control blood pressure uh, in STEMI in advantage to IVGTN? Yeah, now uh, in this setup, of course, if you know the renal functions and the patient who is already on AC inhibitors, patient who is on IRBs, if they are coming with an ST elevation MI, there is no harm continuing with the same medication. But if you don't know the patient's uh, renal functions and if the patient has uh, bradycardia, it is always better to go with a uh, uh, amlodipine or nifedipine or that type of drug but if the patient has tachycardia it is always better to go with a beta beta blocker in the absence of severe heart failure but uh, of course the gtn will be a valuable drug to control in acute phase uh, and then uh, control the blood pressure because you don't want to lower the blood pressure in these situations because there is a sympathetic override and then the pressure goes up in a situation of ischemia it is probably a transient uh, phenomena so this is best managed with an GTN or uh, you know, I would uh, reserve uh, until we uh, do the procedure and then we'll start on AC inhibitors or ARBs. Uh, not like there are good old days that we straight away go with the beta blockers, the AC inhibitors and uh, beta blockers immediately. But, but if the patient has to go on a medical management, if the patient comes late, of course, then you, you have to consider all these uh, other medications. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amar Sekar, for that valuable information. Now we'll be moving into the uh, case discussion, the interest in acute coronary syndrome presentations, the case-based discussion. This will be jointly conducted by Dr. Arun Vijay Singh, who is the consultant cardiologist from Base Hospital Panadura, and uh, Dr. Stanley Amar Sekar, consultant cardiologist and the, and the president of the college. Uh, Dr. Aruna will be starting. Yeah, a few words about the SLMA and I must thank the president and the SLMA, the organizing committee for inviting us to join for this uh, foundation sessions. And from the cardiology, we have actually put uh, some practical uh, situations. And today we are going to discuss some of the, the interesting ACS uh, practical ECGs and their case scenarios. And uh, Dr. Aruna will be presenting it. I'll be discussing it. Okay, thank you, sir. First of all, I would like to thank SLMA for giving this opportunity. More than the ECG, the most important thing is the clinical presentation of the patient. So we have to interpret ECGs with in the background of clinical presentation. Otherwise, we don't have to interpret ECG isolately without considering patients other factors. So the, we will go to the first case. It's a 56-year-old lady with well-controlled type 2 diabetes for three years. She came with intermittent retrosternal chest pain. So first of all, can we move to the Q&A and then we can go to the case discussion? Is it possible? Okay, first, uh, first we will see a few questions to assess your knowledge and then after that, we will go to the proper case discussion and all the answers will be in the case discussion. The first questions, first case is based on this question. 56-year-old lady with, with well-controlled type 2 diabetes for three years, admitted with intermittent retrosternal chest discomfort for last 24 hours. Multiple episodes at rest. Each episode lasts 5 to 10 minutes. And she has having GRD intermittently and taken PPI, but the it's not, pain is not relieved. Patient came to the ETU and high sensitivity troponin was done and it's mildly positive. 
the ECG shows this is the ECG. You can carefully go through the ECG. And the questions, uh, you have to select the best answer. In this patient manages a low risk non-STEMI with enoxaparin for three days, standard regime and XIC ECG in six weeks and if positive for CAT. Otherwise, it is, uh, as patient symptoms are not very clear, we can do a symptom limited XIC ECG before discharge and depending on the finding, we can decide further management. Oh, this is a STEMI and need primary PCI. Fifth one is, this can be a chest pain, young. Um, pulmonary embolism, so CTPA is the next investigation. No, this ECG indicate very tight proximal LAD disease. We'll move back to our ECG. Ask for the poll. Okay, can you go for the poll, please? Any answers from the audience? Oh. Have, you got, have you got anybody answer? It's there. Answer. Okay, you can answer yeah. now. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Ah, it's coming. But it doesn't appear there, is it? Did anybody answer? Yes, yes. Yeah. We, uh, okay. Majority answered five. Ah, good. Excellent. Excellent. I think they have got the correct answer. Yeah. Can you put the ECG back, please? You, can you put back the ECG? Uh, back to the ECG, please. Back to the ECG. Uh, yes. Okay. Looking at this ECG, and the ECG is in sinus rhythm. The heart rate is around uh, just below 100. And the axis is normal. PR interval is normal. Okay. Maybe discuss the case with the other ECGs after this Q&A. This for just to assess their knowledge. And after this, we will go for the case discussion. Is it okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. And the, the ne next question, 36 year old male with no significant past medical history admitted with a severe chest uh, class three and uh, angina for last couple of days. Troponin is significantly positive. So this is the ECG. So the answer should be, this is AVR STEMI, thrombolysis with T and T place, if no primary PCI is available with reasonable time limit. AVR STEMI indicates STEMI involved in right ventricle. Third response is, this is almost always due to severe left main disease. Fourth answer is continuous upcut inoxaparin for three days and send for elective angiogram. Fifth one, this patient need an urgent coronary angiogram. So basically ECG, this is the ECG. These are the answers. Can you go for the Go for the polling, please. In 20 seconds. Okay, thanks. Not yet. Not yet. Um, 25 answered 5 and 22 answered 1. Okay, there is some, some discrepancy. discrepancy between yes. answers. We'll, when we discuss the cases, we will find the answer. Then can you go to the slide slope? Show, please. Okay. The third, the third question. one, the 54 year old male with diabetic hypertension and dyslipidemia admitted with acute onset shortness of breath with central tightness for few hours. No history of ischemic heart disease, blood pressure is 160, few basal crepes, no murmurs. ECG. So the, the 
what is the best management option ctpa to exclude pulmonary embolism urgent echo to exclude aortic dissection high sensitivity troponin at uh, and uh, at admission and repeat at one hour to rule out acute mi start inoxaparin and manage as non stemi or repeat ecg with additional leads the best management option polling please yeah start it start it majority 5 43 yeah 43 got okay repeat decision yeah the question number 4 42 year old patient with dyslipidemia defaulted management family history of premature ischemic heart disease in paternal side ex smoker admitted with significant central chest pain the patient came to the hospital within 30 minutes this is the ecg The best option will be since his ECG is normal, GORD, GOR, GORD is the likely diagnosis. And the second option will be wait for six hours for troponin and if it's positive, manage as non STEMI. Third one, send to cardiologist for urgent echo. Fourth one, CT angiogram, autogram to exclude aortic dissection. Five, this is a hyperacute T wave and need multiple repeated ECGs. for the poll majority good that has five the last case a man in his 50s with history of type 2 diabetes, hypertension and dyslipidemia presented with one day history of on and off chest and upper abdomen epigastric pain. He had woken up from sleep earlier and he described it as gas pain located in the upper epigastrium and radiating upwards. Examination was normal but he looks ill and very sweaty. The ECG on admission. The best answers start dextrose insulin for hyperkalemia because of very tall T waves, manage as non STEMI. This can be a bleeding peptic ulcer, therefore, call the surgeon urgently. This AVR STEMI, need thrombolysis. This indicate very proximal LAD occlusion. Okay, let's go to the, go to the present case discussion now. This is the very first case. I think most of the people have a good understanding of what, I'm, what we are going to discuss. Uh, thanks to Dr. Sampat. So the first case, 56 year old lady with type two diabetes for th uh, three years, admitted with intermittent retrosternal chest pain. So this is the very first ECG. Yeah, now this ECG, if everyone looks at it, uh, you know, in, in the first glance, it looks like a normal ECG with sinus rhythm, 
normal PR interval, axis is normal. But if you carefully look at it, that you can see a slight T wave inversions probably beginning at V2, V3, and V4. And if you repeat this ECG, yeah. When you see there's no gross abnormality, at least if you can't diagnose anything, best thing is to repeat the ECG in at least half an hour. Patient was pain-free, troponin was done, routine blood was sent, query management was query GORD. So this is a repeat ECG, more or less the same. More right? or less the same, repeat ECG. But troponin came as normal, so acute MI was ruled out and the ETUP uh, team thought it's a GORD and patient pl was plan, was the plan was to discharge him. But while awaiting discharge, patient get another chest discomfort and the pain again settled with IV omeprazole. However, there was an emergency medicine SR on call and he requested, she requested a repeat ECG before discharge. Now you can see in this ECG, there are some biphasic T wave inversions in V2, V3 and V4. And these biphasic T inversions, and there's a little bit of symmetrical T inversion in B5, and involvement of the L1 AVL, this suggests that this patient has a significant obstruction in the proximal LAD. And therefore, these patients basically should not be subjected to exercise stress ECGs, or they should not be discharged, particularly with the, these type of ECGs can be sub subtle and sometimes they can have uh, slight troponin elevations and also pseudo normalization together with the pain. And remember that this indicates a very proximal LAD lesion. And these patients should be subjected to coronary angiography straight away. Ideally 10 to, percent, 10 to 15 percent of all our uh, non-STEMU acute coronary syndrome presentations can be this. Unfortunately, the, most of these patients, we, are, we will miss most of these patients because dynamic ECG, negative troponin or mildly elevated troponin, so low, they will be treated as either unstable angina or low risk non STEMI. That's what happened to this patient. And then she was, she, up to day three, inoxaparin was continued and planned to stop inoxaparin on day three, echo discharge and review in two weeks' time. This is the repeat ECG on day three. Still, you can see biphasic T inversions. Uh, this is uh, actually before discharge ECG, there is uh, some improvement of the ECG appearance has improved compared to the previous ECG. And patient underwent, a, after contacting cardiology team, patient underwent a early angiogram before discharge and it shows proximal LAD tight lesion which... Yes. So this is actually Wellen syndrome. Wellen syndrome, this is another patient, serial presentation, so you can see near normal ECGs from the beginning. There are no major abnormalities. But with time, they develop biphasic or symmetrical deep T, deep, deep T inversions in the anterior leads. This is a classical example. So what is Wellen syndrome? It is a ischemic chest pain, T waves inversion or biphasic T in anterior leads. Troponin will be either normal, uh, negative or minimally elevated. There is important thing is no pathological Q waves on the precordial leads and there is no poor R wave progression. But sometimes you might see reverse R wave progression where V1, the V2 R is smaller than V1 or V3 is R is smaller than V2. This is called reverse R wave progression. This is not normal at all. So if, the, if you see a patient, ischemic type chest pain, biphasic or T and uh, anterior T inversions with minimally or normal troponin, no Q waves. This is a Wellen syndrome, and the significance is this is very proximal LAD. So, most of them will develop massive anterior MI within next couple of weeks. This is the best time to save the myocardium, so they need early angiogram before they develop a STEMI. The second case. This is a 36-year-old male with no significant past medical history. He had a new onset class 3 angina for last couple of days. He, so he was a heavy smoker. So on admission, his troponin is 25,000, significantly high, routine bloods were normal. This is the e ECG. Yeah. Now, he is a young man and he is a heavy smoker. Now in this ECG, you can, you can see it's pretty obvious that ECG is in sinus rhythm and the rate is within normal limits. 
but the hallmark is the AVR ST is elevated against diffused ST depressions in L1 A, A, AVL lead 2 lead 5 6 2 3 everything so if you see B1 and AVR ST elevation you must think of uh, a significant left main or left main equivalent disease and these patients although it is in guidelines classified as ST elevation MI of AVR there are very few of them have the clots in the left main but they can be there can be a clot in the LAD but in a left main situation you should not give the reperfusion uh, treatment for these patients these patients should be sent for coronary angiography and uh, that is the most important thing of recognizing this but this is not limited to uh, left main disease the VRST elevation can be subjected to different conditions as well but in the given case scenario of acute coronary syndrome that this has to be taken as left main this is the echocardiogram of the same patient you can see very poor LV function basic there is marked reduction of ejection fraction with the uh, multiple wall motion abnormalities are seen the coronary angiogram confirms the left main disease as you can see it is the the, the left main distal left main involving the ostium of the lady and the circumflex both and patient underwent successful pci to left main to a lady and a lady bifurcation the right side right shows the after pci So, ST elevation in AVR, as Dr. Stanley Amrasekar said, it's not specific to a LMC occlusion, but it can be presented. It can present it either proximal LAD occlusion, severe triple SL disease, or the most important thing is significant subendocardial ischemia due to supply uh, demand mismatch, such as SCTs, fast atrial fibrillation, septic shock, or acute bleeding. So, whenever you see ST elevation in AVR. With, uh, associated with widespread ST depression, it is not acute coronary syndrome. First thing is you have to exclude non-acute coronary syndrome things because management will be different. So always look for septic uh, sepsis, acute bleeding, severe, uh, any evidence of hypoperfusion. So if they, after excluding those things, you can look for evidence of acute coronary syndrome as well. And please do not uh, comment on uh, reperfusion treatment like uh, septokinase or tenecteplase at this moment immediately. Yeah. So the the actually, if you go through the 12 leads of ECG, this is a funny lead because almost our other 11 e e ECG leads have their specific designated myocardial mass, but AVR itself has no myocardial mass. So actually, it's looking for the mouth of the LV cavity. So LV, ST elevation in the AVR usually a manifestation of the severe, uh, it's a reciprocal ST elevation due to the ST depression in the LV cavity. So actually this, even though this is called ST elevation in the AVR ST elevation, ideally this is a widespread ST depression and this widespread ST depression has caused reciprocal ST elevation. That's why we don't thrombolize. This is not a true STEMI. So we have to remember that even though it is a ST, ST elevation in AVR, it is not a true STEMI. It is a reciprocal manifestation of the ST depression in other leads. Basically, uh, the multi-segment, uh, the severe diffuse ischemia due to either left main disease or proximal LAD disease cause the large area of ischemia in the myocardium and ST depression. So these ST depressions in the lateral, inferior and posterior leads can be manifested as ST elevation in AVR. So that's why we don't give thrombo uh, 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 thrombolysis for these patients. So causes for AVR ST elevation, diffuse uh, endocardial ischemia or infarction of the basal septum very rarely, but it's always almost always associated with anterior STEMI or otherwise diffuse ischemia. So other thing is the risk. These patients have very high risk of mortality and the mortality is proportionate to the ST elevation. So, so higher the ST elevation, higher the mortality. So they need early coronary angiogram and most of them may end up with CABG, if uh, early CABG. So better not to give inoxap uh, even clopidogrel if we can arrange early angiogram because patient uh, giving clopidogrel can be problematic. So ideal management would be give aspirin 
treat with enoxaparin or heparin and go for early angiogram and decide on the management. But in our setup, early angiogram and even early CABG is not feasible for most of the patients. So unfortunately, these majority of these patients will be managed medically. So important thing is there is no need for thrombolysis. The third case, 54-year-old male, diabetic hypertension and dyslipidemia, admitted with acute onset, shortness of breath with central chest tightness for few hours. No history of ischemic heart disease, blood pressure is slightly high, few basal crepes, no murmurs. This is the ECG. The ECG shows a uh, heart rate of uh, around 60 and uh, there is ST depressions in V1, V2 and V3. ECG is in sinus rhythm and VR is normal and there is you can see slight hyperacute type T waves in L2, L3 and AVF. So this could be either a non-ST elevation of anterior or a posterior myocardial infarction. So best thing is to repeat the leads on the 678. All right, now you can see, as you can see, the 789 ECGs are taken. 7 is posterior axial line, 5th intercostal space, 8 is below the spine, 9 is just transverse spine of the same space. I have shown that 1 millimeter is elevation. This is very sensitive. If you can get 0.5 to 1 millimeter, that's very significant. And you have to do it as early as possible because these ECG changes can disappear in the next hour. So to recognize if the 12 lead ECG is normal, if the patient comes with acute coronary syndrome, best thing is to repeat the 789 ECGs. Now this suggests and confirms that this is a posterior myocardial infarction. Okay, let's move to the case for fourth case. This is a 42 year old patient with dyslipidemia, defaulted management, family history of premature ischemic heart disease in paternal side, ex smoker. Patient had a significant central chest pain. He described as 7 out of 10 and he present very airy thanks to our ambulance. This is the first ECG. The ECG shows the normal heart rate, sinus rhythm, but there are some uh, negative Q waves in 3 and AVF and also in lead 2. And the anterior leads are showing a little bit of hyperacute type T waves. I think it's best to repeat this ECG and see again. Yes, Dr. Stanley described there is a Q waves in lead 3 and AVF, so it can be an old inferior MI. So this patient, even though he didn't give a history of ischemic heart disease, he's very likely to have a significant coronary artery disease. So this patient, because of severe chest pain, it's managed as acute coronary syndrome, but apparently there is no acute ischemic changes. Q in uh, the old, so inter his troponin, high sensitivity troponin was done and it was eight. Uh, it is eight, actually it's negative. On admission, troponin was negative. Then ECG repeated one hour later. There is no much significant changes compared to the previous ECG, still remain uh, looks very tall T waves. But there is no ST depression or other T wave changes. So the second hour troponin came as 458. Pain is much better. Hemodynamic stable. So team decided troponin is positive. There is no significant ECG changes. Patient was transferred to the medical ward with management of a uh, diagnosis of non-STEMI. This is around 4, 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the evening. So unfortunately in the medical ward he didn't have any repeat ECGs. And the next Next day, a patient was much better, so inoxaparin was ne next co uh, continued. ECG was done 10 a.m. in the next day. This is the ECG. The ECG shows the uh, there's two inversions in all these anterior leads and also in inferior leads and lateral leads. So this suggests that this patient has a proximal LDD lesion with an anterior myocardial infarction. Yeah, there is a Q waves in the two, three. No, uh, we lead V2, V3, V4, yeah. even, yeah, so there's a Q wave infarction. Actually, we have missed the we anterior have. STEMI by now. Patient came yesterday 4 p.m. 
the third ECG, the first and second ECG is done 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. The third ECG was done at next day 10 a.m. So a patient has developed a ST elevation. He presented early, developed ST elevation, but we missed to diagnose it because we didn't repeat ECGs. So he missed the proper management. So actually this is a, not a late presentation, late diagnosis of anterior STEMI. Now, unfortunately, there is no indication for tenectal thrombolysis because the 12 hour patient is now pain free, the 12 hours has gone. So this is a relatively common presentation now, thanks to our ambulance, they came very early and they present with a, so ECG shows hyperacute ECGs, but no other ST changes or T innovation. So we think these ECGs are normal. And troponin, if you have facilities, they can be, uh, even if you have high sensitive troponin, it can be marginally positive if you done very early. So then when before sending to medical load, best thing was to repeat at least three or four ECGs. And even after sending to medical loads, we have to repeat few ECGs before diagnose, uh, labeling them as normal ECGs. So this is the angiogram. I think most of us, most of uh, you all don't have much uh, understanding about the coronary angiogram. This is the LAD. Actually, LAD is completely gone. This is after urgent PCI. This uh, angiogram was done because this late uh, diagnosis and it is actually our failure so we contacted the cardiology team because this is our failure so they accept the patient and did the angiogram and stented but outcome won't be the same as if we did it earlier now the myocardium is probably most of the myocardium is dead non-viable even though artery looks good so ejection fraction will be low any comments yeah i think uh you know, even uh, because he's a diabetic and uh, in the absence of chest pain, he's within 24 hours. And uh, he, although ECG shows key waves, I think it's worth going for an angiogram and opening the vessel because there may be uh, there's a ischemic prenumbra in the myocardium uh, which can be saved on these patients. Yeah, according to the guideline, I think up to 48 hours, oh, there yes. is an indication for opening, but after 48, there is no indication. But the important thing is we should not miss this anterior early presentation of anterior STEMIs or whatever. STEMIs. Yeah, the whole mark is when you see the T waves are upright and tall and you think it they are hyperacute, you must make sure that until you diagnose the case that it can be an anterior myocardial infarction, particularly in anterior leads. The last case, a man in his 50s with history of type 2 diabetes, hypertension and dyslipidemia presented with one day history of, of an on and off chest pain and epigastric discomfort. He described it as gas pain, gastritis. The examination was normal, but he's a bit ill looking and sweaty. This is the ECG. Yeah, this ECG, the patient has a heart rate of about 80 and the sinus rhythm in normal PR interval but the axis is uh, on the left axis with some uh, key waves in T3 and AVF. And also there is a hyperacute type of uh, T's with a slightly upsloping ST's on uh, V1, V2, sorry, V3, V4, V5. So this again indicates that one has to think of uh, ongoing ischemia and you need to repeat the ECG. Actually, this is the 20 minutes later. Yeah, that looks uh, more hyperacute than last time and the STs are uh, more prominent. Uh, so I think we are going ahead with an anterior myocardial infarction progressing. Uh, yes, ideally, apart from the hyperacute uh, T waves, you can concentrate on the ST segments. If, you, if I can show the previous ECG. There is no ST depression. Yes. Here there is a slight ST depression. Even the very first ECG, you can yeah. see there is a slight ST depression in V3 and V4, even yeah, V5. Upsloping ST upsloping depression. Upsloping ST yes. depression. Yeah. yeah. This is remarked in this yeah. ECG. This is pathognomic of anterior, uh, very proximal LAD syndrome. Yeah. So we don't have to wait for gross ST elevation in this case. Yes. 
this is the third ecg one hour this the, but this wasting of tau yeah, that's time. a very early stage of anterior myocardial infarction this called de winter syndrome this an anterior st- the, actually this ecg is a anterior stemi equivalent so you can activate the cath lab or you can give th- if you are very confident you can give thrombolysis even so all prominent symmetrical t waves in the precordial leads the, the, usually de winter doesn't describe by in, uh, in hypoacute t waves can be seen in any leads even inferior anterior lateral but de winter is almost always anterior upsloping st segment depression it's upsloping st segment depression more than 1, one mm at j point in the precordial leads absence of st elevation in the precordial leads actually this develop before st elevation and usually it, since it's very proximal lad it supplies this uh, uh, it can affect the first septal branch those there is a st elevation in the avr as well and usually and uh, then within one or two hours normal st elevation will develop the another example this is a separate uh, different patient but you can see classical J uh, ST upsloping ST depression in V2, V3, V4, V5, even V6 in this patient. This is another patient. These are somewhat rare presentation than the valence syndrome. Valence is 10 to 15 percent of our acute coronary non-stemis will be valent, but this is around 1 to 2 percent. So you might not see these patients, but this is a early indicator. The indication the you have to be very careful of these patients because you can save a lot of myocardium if we treat them very early and these are the important uh, so as a summary i would like to show five uh, four cases i described and one more additional thing in which uh, you don't see classical st elevations but almost equal to st elevations and high risk acute coronary syndrome the one the first one is first diagonal branch of the lad territory ischemia uh, in, uh, occlusion so it's a diagonal first diagonal supply large part of the left ventricle so it can cause significant le dysfunction if we ignore this in this case the, you won't see significant st elevation in the precordial leads usually it's associated with avl and one so, so one and avl this is called high lateral st elevation mi and usually it is associated with inverted T waves in 3 and AVF because this ST elevation in the high lateral segment is reciprocal to the inferior part. So in inferior leads will identify this ST elevation as ST segments. So those are not due to inferior ischemia, actually infer- these are reciprocal changes in the anterior uh, lateral myocardial wall. The, th- the second one is we discussed the d- de winter upsloping ST depression at J point eleva- uh, segments without ST elevation with tall symmetrical t wave this indicate very proximal lad occlusion the third one is left main occlusion or left main equivalent in this case actually if somebody has a complete left main occlusion very unlikely to have normal hemodynamics he will be in a cardiogenic shock and will be dead in few minutes very unlikely to come to cath lab with a completely occluded left main so the, most of these patients has partial occlusion of the left main with a significant occlusion of the LAD and circumflex. So their flow is maintained, but that's significant, significant ischemia. So they have widespread ST depressions and as a result, they got reciprocal ST elevation in the AVR. The important thing is we should not thrombolize these patients. They have, we have to give standard management with inoxaparin and early angiogram. The valence syndrome, deeply inverted T waves or biphasic T waves in the anterior leads indicate proximal LAD syndrome and there is no Q waves or poor R wave progression in these ECGs. The last one is a posterior wall acute. If it is associated with inferior MI, it's easy to diagnose because there is a ST elevations in the inferior leads, but isolated posterior waves, you will see the mirror image of the ST elevation in V1, V2, V3. Sometime V1, you won't see any significant ST depression. ST depression can be limited to V2 and V3. So if there is a good R wave with ST depression in V2 and V3 with a ba- background of chest pain, always we have to suspect posterior MI and better to do V6, uh, V7, V8, V9 leads to look for posterior infarction. 
uh, i think that's all uh, we have to discuss today thank you so uh, thank you dr arnav j singha and dr stanley amrasekar for that very interesting and informative course case based discussion now we are moving to the last presentation of this symposium that's a practical approach to sudden cardiac death by dr susita amrasinghe a consultant a cardiac electrophysiologist from the teaching hospital karavitia thank you good evening everybody thank you very much uh, president and i'd like to uh, first of all thank the sri lanka medical association organizing committee for taking the challenge and uh, organizing this conference in a virtual format uh, as well as i would like to congratulate the online audience who's uh, staying connected for the whole day uh, moving to the talk uh, after two comprehensive uh, discussions on acute coronary syndrome related uh, uh, presentations Uh, let us talk about sudden cardiac death a practical approach to the management and prevention and uh, it's important to understand it is not the same as acute coronary syndrome though there is a significant overlap so uh, sudden cardiac death though we don't consider it as common it's not uncommon it's actually uh, it's the cause for most of the cardiovascular deaths as well as it is only second to uh, all cause mortality of all cancers combined worldwide and uh, there are a few terms and definitions that we need to be familiar with when we are trying to understand about sudden cardiac arrest and death sudden cessation of the cardiac activity leading to circulatory collapse is called sudden cardiac arrest where the patient may recover subsequently and sudden cardiac death is when the patient uh, dies during within an hour of onset of symptoms an abortion sudden cardiac arrest is when the patient survives the cardiac arrest event and we know sudden infant death syndrome is also quite similar where the, uh, the unfortunately the, uh, the infant dies within the first 6 months of life sad or sudden arrhythmia death is also the same so epidemiology few words uh, scd or sudden cardiac death accounts for 15% of all deaths and 50% of cardiac arrests as we discuss and incidence overall incidence in the population is about 1 to 2% however in high risk population as well as as the age advances the incidence goes up exponentially and we know time to time we see this in public domain in the media and quite striking Uh, news about uh, young or otherwise very healthy people dying in fact pe- individuals some some are much healthier than most of us just dying suddenly spontaneously which is very devastating and it's not only in international arena it's even in the the lo- our local setup we do see this and quite unfortunate how do we approach or how do we manage the golden principal this effective cpr and uh, what is called sudden cardiac arrest related chain of survival which denotes early access to effective cpr early cpr early defibrillation early advanced care and definitive management these things need to be uh, very familiar uh, concepts for every doctor these days and this graph is a very valuable graph to de- depict that the time takes for resuscitation or onset of resuscitation and how it affect the survival subsequently you can understand every minute goes past without a cpr the chance of survival for the victim goes down by 10% and this is also confirmed in multiple international studies where now the uh, the concept is to introduce early defibrillation in the community level and this has increase the survival of these patients who suddenly develop sudden cardiac arrest and defibrillation we all should be familiar and there are three modalities the manual defibrillator that we all have we all see in the uh, hospital setup and the community setup based uh, automated external defibrillators which can even guide a lay person to extend to uh, carry out a defibrillation in case of a cardiac arrest and of course as a definitive management what we implant is a implantable cardioverter defibrillator so all three have the same purpose of terminating a malignant ventricular arrhythmia 
So before we go into in detail, let us see few case scenarios. All of these cases are cases that presented to either to teaching hospital Karapiti or the regional hospitals in southern province. And uh, you can see how devastating and how striking these presentations are. A 49-year-old male, an uh, executive of a private company, who, who had his history of diabetes, which he was not taking regular medications for, or was obviously having high BMI, uh, uh, being treated for GORD, mostly by himself, and occasional episodes of chest discomfort. And he was found collapsed at the office and after an, another episode of heavy gastric pain. There was unfortunately no bystander CPR and brought to the ETU in electromechanical dissociation. The rhythm was electromechanical dissociation with fixed dilated pupils. The subsequent postmortem revealed a LAD territory infarction. So you can see what we have been discussing all this time, how significant is acute chronic syndrome and sometimes the patient doesn't survive the event to reach a hospital alive. And that's why the management of acute current syndrome is so important and awareness is so important and most importantly prevention is or early detection and management of coronary heart disease before it goes into developed acute current syndrome is the most important uh, case two a 32 year old male a military personnel without any significant previous history who has had a recent febrile illness with a respiratory tract infection and was also recovering from same he had a good lunch, uh, maybe because he was recovering from the illness and went for sleep after the lunch in the afternoon, only to be found by found dead at around 4 p.m. by his own mother, which was a devastating incident. And uh, the, he was one of two boys in the family. Uh, the mother never recovered from the, the loss and the bereavement. And uh, this shows how dramatic and how devastating what is the entity of sudden cardiac death. Uh, his ECGs, he has had a couple of ECGs done before for annual medical checkups that was done for military, uh, military recruitment as well as for continuation of military service, which was uh, found to have non specific easy changes according to the records uh, to be eventually found to be Brugada related. Uh, the, the Brugada syndrome, I'm sure most of you are familiar, we will discuss about it. And in Sri Lanka, it's not uncommon to have this scenario. The case is a 17-year-old 70 year male, previously well, involved in many sports at, at school. Uh, he was nearing uh, sc uh, school leaving age and only symptom he has had previously was occasional mild fainting. So pre syncope never had a syncopal episode or collapse. He uh, participated in a marathon where he collapsed. And unfortunately, again, there was no systematic CPR given at, at the site. And uh, he was presented to ETU in a local hospital in VF, despite uh, an extensive uh, effort with resuscitation, patient didn't recover and postmortem revealed a hypertrophic heart, which is uh, actually the diagnosis is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, the fourth case is a 69 year old male, a previously diagnosed STEMI patient, a patient who has had a ST elevation myocardial infarction five years ago, who has been on regular medication and monthly clinical follow-up, wh whose ejection fraction was 35, and the ECGs showed ventricular ectopics. And he has had several episodes of pre-syncope and syncope. And uh, he has been generally reassured that these are mild symptoms and post mostly posture related. However, he was found dead during sleep in one of the nights. And uh, remember, just because a patient had, was on regular medications and monthly clinical follow-up, that doesn't really mean that he was always uh, assured of safety. He may not have been compliant, he may not have been on the ideal med medication management, or he may, the clinic management, there may have been things that needed to address. So we'll discuss this in detail in a little while. So how do we identify those P patients who are at risk of developing this uh, devastating event? So there's no one way. And it's very challenging because we are talking about a whole population with various subcategories of groups involved in various risks. So, however, symptoms or physical symptoms and signs are always helpful and is again the basis of uh, uh, clinical decision making to decide on uh, down which line we are going to investigate them. Some Critical symptoms that you should analyze are shortness of breath or chest pain that limits exercise or unexplained disease spells or blackouts, especially on exhaustion, 
prolonged palpitation. All these are should be eye openers. And family history is very important. If there's a first degree letter with a history of ca cardiac death, it's going to be really important as well as extended family history. And anyway, uh, anybody in the family with any suspicious symptoms as well. In and screening is not really easy, very challenging because the, we don't know where to draw the line. We can't be screening every, each and every child in the schools or everybody who, who participate in uh, uh, strenuous exercises. However, we need to consider this. So we, if we analyze the causes of sudden cardiac death, coronary artery disease, of course, is by far the commonest cause. And as we mentioned, up to 50% of deaths related to the coronary artery death happens as sudden cardiac deaths. And in addition, the cardiomyopathies, which may be dilated cardiomyopathy, secondary any form of etiology or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. These are def definite entities that you all people out of whom you are interested can uh, study these and uh, there are ways of identifying these on these ages. And inherited arrhythmia syndromes, pellular heart disease as well as other causes that are not directly cardiac such as metabolic drugs and uh, substances can be causes for sudden cardiac death. If you look at the underlying arrhythmia mechanism that leads to sudden cardiac arrest, by far the biggest factor is the ventricular tachyarrhythmias, which subsequently degenerate into ventricular fibrillation, or they are centric called primary ventricular fibrillation, or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, and advanced bradycardias. Advanced decrease of heart blocks can also be the reason. So identify high risk populations. So we need to be aware that certain high risk categories like a patient who has had a cardiac myocardial infarction within last six weeks or who has had the LV scar following MI, even if it is a long term one and who's having a residual LV dysfunction as well as the patients that we discuss underlying cardiomyopathy or inherited ch acquired channel effects. And it's important to understand it's not a fa one factor generally that uh, leads to sudden cardiac death. It's an interplay of multiple factors. The more the factors, the higher the risk. And the one, uh, substrate is one main category where such a, factors such as coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathies, or underlying channel pathies, all these can be playing a uh, major role. And the triggering event is the other important thing, which can be metabolic, drugs, electrolytes, trans, uh, neuro or endocrine, such a, like that. And the underlying mechanism, if there's any re-entry already happening inside the myocardium or automaticity, triggered activity, all this will facilitate a malignant ventricular arrhythmia. One factor is enough to cause a ventricular arrhythmia, however, combination will increase the chances of developing sudden cardiac arrhythmia. This is how it happens. So if you have to talk about tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias which are at high risk but one thing we need to know is so this is somewhat basic every doctor generally will understand advanced decrease of tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias are significant also we need to understand interpreting an arrhythmia and the significance of the arrhythmia in the context of, context of how fatal the arrhythmia can be we need to not only look at the ECG appearance of the tachyarrhythmia, we need to look at the whole patient, understand whether the patient is a physiologically normal patient or a patient with a physiological uh, limitation of the physiological reserve. Someone who already has a compromised heart or compromised uh, lungs or pulmonary capacity will be tolerating an arrhythmia poorly than a person with a normal reserve. So uh, whether they go into develop a sudden cardiac death or not is not only based on the arrhythmia itself, also their capability of tolerating the arrhythmia. When we talk about the sudden cardiac death, we generally talk about the sudden uh, cardiac death related arrhythmia occurring in a structurally normal heart, structurally abnormal heart, and also due to non-cardiac causes. So we discuss some of it, and the primary electrical disease of the heart, inherited or acquired, is a dramatic in the sense that whatever the investigation that generally we do will become normal. So the echocardiogram uh, can be normal. ECG generally will show some abnormalities if you look at it carefully. And the metabolic drugs and transient or reversible causes can also be contributing to sudden cardiac arrest in, uh, in the context of non-cardiac causes. So it's important to differentiate between 
the true sudden cardiac death versus myocardial infarction. We are, being doctors, we are aware of the classical symptoms of myocardial infarction. Sudden cardiac arrest is somewhat uh, different. Yeah. The patient's primary symptom could be the palpitations or pre syncope followed by loss of consciousness. So we have discussed enough about coronary artery diseases and uh, how, how it can lead to sudden cardiac arrest. And you can see uh, what we see on the ECG or echocardiogram, what we see in the reality uh, in the histology is quite correlating. And we see a complete occlusion of major blood vessels when people present with a devastating event of sudden cardiac death. And left, left ventricular dysfunction is the other important factor uh, that predicts the risk of sudden cardiac death. We sometimes don't realize that uh, our assumption is that left ventricular dysfunction leads to shortness of breath and multiple symptoms. In the same time, it leads to a risk of ventricular arrhythmias as well. Itself, it's not 100% accurate, but it gives you uh, the opportunity to uh, identify people who are at a higher risk so that you can arrange more assessment or keep a closer eye on them so that these people will not be lost for follow up and to see how risky they are in the long term and how to avoid, uh, how to save them from dying due to a sudden cardiac arrest. And this graph demonstrates how very well the combination of factors like ejection, low ejection fraction and presence of ventricular ectopics or ventricular arrhythmias on ESG so 24 halters, how it increases the chances of them developing fatal arrhythmias. And there's enough and more evidence suggesting that underlying uh, cardiac status, including infraction, can be directly correlating with uh, risk of sudden cardiac death. And apart from the coronary artery diseases related sudden cardiac death, these are the commonest causes that, uh, or the most striking causes that lead to sudden cardiac death, which include some of the uh, case scenarios that we discussed at the beginning. So, few ECGs. Uh, this is a classic ECG of a patient who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you can see very characteristically features of left ventricular hypertrophy. And uh, when you do an echocardiogram, that will sh show thickened, characteristically thickened myocardium in the left ventricle, which is actually the substrate for arrhythmias. And again, another ECG that can go unnoticed if you don't have a look, uh, closer look on these people and if you talk to them you will know that they are generally having classical symptoms of palpitations or uh, pre-syncope or syncope. So this is a patient This is a patient whom we took to the e EP lab where we induced the tachyarrhythmia based on his symptoms and identified that he had electrical connection connecting the atrium to the ventricle. If you look at the top line, you see that the patient has a pre-excitation on the ECG, which disappears during radio frequency ablation. So the message is that some of these are curable and patient can live a normal life thereafter and without having having any risk of sudden cardiac death. So another uh, classic ECG of a patient who present with a cardiac arrest is the, when you look at the ECG, if you're familiar, you will know that the V1, V2 leads does, doesn't look normal up to V3. And it, it's very characteristically in lead V1, you see the uh, hump towards the uh, end of the QRS complex, which is called epsilon wave. So this is the histology where the right ventricle is grossly abnormal. And in fact, these people, when they, when they develop the advanced disease, go on to develop ventr left ventricular abnormalities as well. Generally, they, their life expectancy is normal, not normal, unless we intervene and uh, manage the risk of sudden cardiac death. And this is the other classical ECG that we very often see in Sri Lanka. This is, uh, we are in a hot spot for this particular abnormality, which is called Brugada syndrome, which is secondary to sodium channelopathy of the cardiac myocytes. And identifying it is easy when it present in this way in V1, lead V1, V2, V3, you see strikingly abnormal down sloping ST elevations, which amounts to type 1 Brugada pattern. However, there are occasional, there are other two ty types which sometimes can be difficult to diagnose, which are type 2 and 3. What is more challenging is that these patterns can be interchanging between each other depending on the, the factors. And uh, it's always better to have a high degree of suspicion to make sure that these people are not missed. This is what it causes. It causes a ventricular fibrillation generally in the night or after a uh, triggering event. And another classic condition is long QT syndrome where there are various types of different subtypes. 
even uh, which leads to acute prolongation which uh, is which predisposes patients to develop polymorphic ventricular tachycardia so one such patient whom we had who went into develop multiple polymorphic ventricular arrhythmias eventually requiring implantation of a device so there are more than 13 to 14 subtypes However, on this EG, if you see carefully, they all will present with acute prolongation. Sometimes very difficult to diagnose unless you have a high degree of suspicion. In the same way, the relatively new diagnosis is short QT syndrome, another malignant condition. Patients, unless managed they, properly, they will not survive to adulthood. They present with acute interval generally less than 350 milliseconds and with tachyarrhythmias, either atrial or ventricular, and the fatal event will be due to a ventricular arrhythmia. So, another not so uncommon, however not common, uh, category is what is called catecholaminergic polymorphic VT. Generally, they are well during uh, rest, and the moment they go on to develop uh, strenuous exercise, they develop this, what is called by uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or bidirectional ventricular tachyarrhythmia with multiple morphologies of ventricular tachycardia, at least of two varieties, and they are going to develop VF subsequently. So, idiopathic ventricular fibrillation is also uh, uh, another entity that leads to sudden cardiac death, which encompasses uh, early repressation syndrome to extent, as well as JVF syndrome, and somewhat poorly defined entity at the moment. However, people who have structural normal heart, completely normal ECGs, who suddenly develop ventricular fibrillation, some of them have this entity. And the people who survive a sudden cardiac arrest are known to have a very high risk of a second arrest. So, just because someone re re survive an event doesn't mean that they are going to be okay afterwards. Actually, they are going to have higher risk of another event that means they will need definitive management in the form of medications as well as device therapy so depending on uh, the presentation following a sudden cardiac arrest uh, following a resuscitation of a sudden cardiac arrest uh, depending if we are sure about the arrhythmia that the patient presented with then the investigation will be based on that if you are not sure about the presentation and the arrhythmia, then it will involve an extensive workup to identify what was the primary arrhythmia that led to the cardiac arrest. However, if there is no identifiable cause, then you also need to think about reversible causes, substance abuse, or other non-cardiac causes as well. Can it be prevented? It's very challenging, but it can. If we, if we take the right steps, we can, to a large extent. And ideally, it should be done before a patient develops a cardiac arrest, obviously, or at least after when they recover, when they survive an event. There are two concepts which are called primary prevention and secondary prevention. Primary prevention is when uh, before they develop a cardiac arrest, and secondary prevention is people who have had a cardiac arrest who survived who need a secondary prevention of a second cardiac arrest, which involves lifestyle modifications and identifying and managing their primary arrhythmia condition as well as making sure that they are on the optimum medication, the right category of patients who need to be offered what is called an implantable cardioid defibrillator, which is the gold standard in preventing a ventricular arrhythmia or managing a ventricular arrhythmia, and other option of managing the underlying cause like correcting coronary heart disease by, uh, by revascularization or managing any underlying, underlying arrhythmia mechanisms by radiofrequency so ablation or implantation of pacing devices. So how do we evaluate these people, uh, individuals or their families? There, there need to be a set protocol, which need to start with a solid history, taking a solid history and examination, followed by methodical examination of basic investigations, including ECG to echocardiogram and further evaluation. Ideally, we should have the genetic testing. However, in the Sri Lankan setup, we are not there yet on a routine scale. We need to be uh, we need to be introducing this in Sri Lanka. So ECG is not a very specific tool in exactly identifying the primary arrhythmia in some of the cases at least, but it can give useful clues always. And echocardiogram, as we study, uh, we discuss as well as electrophysiology studies and various other techniques are generally used to different degrees. One challenging scenario is how to reassure school children in participating in sports or how to prevent them participating in uh, sports. Both are very challenging and very heartbreaking. 
uh, in the sense that we don't want to deny someone of uh, uh, opportunity to be involved in sports activities however it uh, sometimes it's difficult not to do so because some people actually have ongoing risk of developing a cardiac uh, arrhythmia or cardiac arrest so there are various guidelines internationally following conditions generally are uh, prohibited from participating in uh, competitive sports at least or professional level sports like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy coronary artery congenital coronary artery abnormalities cardiomyopathies structural cardiac disease like significant mitral valve collapse which present with ventricular uh, arrhythmias and other genetic uh, arrhythmia syndromes in summary prevention is possible however it needs a methodical approach and treatment uh, of sun cardiac arrest is primary focus should be on effective cpr with a chain of survival uh, access to chain of survival thank you thank you dr sushita uh, for your excellent presentation now we have come to the conclusion of uh, cardiology case based uh, practical approach to the problems in the heartbeat of SLME Sri Lanka Foundation sessions. I must thank the SLME Foundation uh, sessions organized by the President and the Council and the Organizing Committee first of all. And uh, in our cardiology sessions, we have discussed today the acute coronary syndrome with a lecture and a case about five cases uh, by Dr. Uh, Aruna and Dr. Sampath by the lecture and also which was coupled with a sudden cardiac death with a very practical approach how you manage on this by Dr. Susita and uh, as the president of uh, College of Cardiology I must express my sincere thanks to uh, the all the organizing committee of uh, SLMA for uh, giving us this opportunity and to complete this session virtually. I must thank all the virtual participants who have been taking time so long from the whole day waiting for us to get all this and thank you so much thank you thank you dr amrsekar and with that we come to the end of the symposium as well as the end of the slma foundation sessions 2020 which was conducted completely online for the first time in the history and i would like to thank everyone who has contributed to make this a grand success there was a time period where none of us were even sure whether you can would could conduct these sessions and uh, finally the council and SLM has decided to go ahead and I think that was the correct decision to take and also uh, one notable fact is that this this the highest participation ever that was recorded at SLM foundation sessions. So uh, on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association I would like to thank all of you all the resource persons and the council the chair persons and our technical partners that's Institute of Multimedia Education. And most importantly, all of you, the partners who have participated during the whole day, and uh, there was, it, it was a record participation with very interesting and interactive participation. And uh, I think we were able to address most of the questions that were raised. There may be some that were not addressed, but we'll be try to address through maybe through our resource persons. And all this material will be made available to all of you as video. Uh, so with that, we come to the end of the sessions and thank you and have a nice evening.